looks like we're ready to go. So thank you everyone for joining and look at that. There's now a live button. So uh, thank, thank you everyone for coming today. Uh, we will get started now. My name is Nicholas Barber. I'm a PhD student uh, in the department and I'm gonna be chairing the discussion today. The, uh, I, I'm just, I guess I'll just keep rolling if we're working okay. Um, thank you everyone for, for joining us. And thank you for your patience as we've gotten some of the technical issues worked out. Uh, thank you for joining us for the second uh, uh, the second presentation in our seminar series, Geoscience in Context. Uh, we're really excited to be bringing Dr. Jasmine Scarlett here today. I'll introduce Jasmine in a moment, uh, but I just want to start off by reminding everyone what the aims of the seminar series are and emphasizing the importance of the code of conduct as we get to the discussion session uh, section of the series today. So the aim of this seminar series is to broaden our department's understanding of geoscience, uh, geoscience's place in society. Liz Hyde gave us an excellent presentation last time outlining uh, the scope of decolonization in the context of the Cedric Museum. And we had a great discussion after uh, her presentation a few weeks ago, uh, two weeks ago. And I, I, I'm hopeful that we'll have a similarly really productive conversation today after uh, Dr. Scarlett's talk. Um, the, before, uh, before we get started, I also just want to emphasize the importance of the code of conduct. By participating in this seminar series, you're agreeing to that code of conduct. And these, these are guidelines that, that emphasize the importance of maintaining a harassment-free environment uh, and ensuring that discussions respect chair decisions and respect the identities of uh, the different identities of all participants. So that's just something to, to emphasize right at the start here. Uh, and if you have any feedback, get in touch with the committee members. That was the, the committee members who organized the seminar series were in the email announcement. So get in touch with any of us, preferably Ollie, because uh, he's the, the, the lead faculty person on, on the committee. Uh, but any of us were happy to take your uh, feedback into account. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jasmine Scarlett. Jasmine uh, uh, is a volcanologist who did her, her BSc uh, with honors at, in natural hazards at Coventry, uh, her MSc in volcanology at Lancaster, and her PhD in earth sciences at the University of Hull. Um, Jasmine's research interests cover a wide range of topics, uh, and I've had the pleasure of hearing Jasmine present at uh, Volca Volcano Magmatic Studies Group's uh, meetings before, so I'm really excited to be, get, get to hear another talk from her today. Uh, her, her main interests include things like the historical and social context of volcanic eruptions, the creation and preservation of volcanic knowledge, uh, and how interconnected vulnerability risk and resilience are to culture. The presentation that she's going to give today is titled The Keys to the Past, a Mixed Methods Approach to Reconstructing the 1812 Eruption of La Soufrière in St. Vincent. Uh, so Jasmine, welcome. Thank you. Um, okay, let's hope technology does work. Um, Share my screen. Grand. All right, I'll go with you guys. Okay. So, yeah. So, uh, today I'm talking about a uh, part of my PhD research, uh, which focused on uh, doing a historical approach into understanding what happened during 1812 eruption of La Soufrière. Um, just before I start, my supervisors were Rebecca Williams, who's a volcanologist. Uh, Greg Bankoff, who's an environmental historian, and Bryony McDonough, who's historical and cultural geographer who specializes in feminist uh, geography. So I had a very diverse um, and really interesting group of supervisors um, to help me um, get to the end of the PhD. And uh, I've had so much fun working with them and hopefully I can work with them in the future. Uh, and just uh, throughout this PhD, I managed to um, get some additional funding from the Royal Geographical Society, VMSG, and Geologist Association. So I'd just like to thank them. So before I begin, I just want to just briefly touch upon my territorial acknowledgement. So uh, this thesis was conducted on uh, uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines that once belonged to the Kalinigo and the Guafana. The Guafana were runaway slaves that intermarried with the original indigenous group, the Kalinigo. Um, Essentially, due to colonization, uh, these two groups were put at higher risk of the eruptions of La Soufrière. Um, so I've just done my utmost best to um, respect their belonging and sovereignty of the island um, into the narrative of this thesis. So today, I'm just going to introduce you to the project, give a brief history of St. Vincent up till the 1812 eruption, 
uh, how I uh, did my mixed methods approach, uh, talk briefly about working with past records and science voices, and then an overview of the eruption itself, and then a summary at the end. So, introduction. So, as I mentioned, this is a historical and social volcanology project, and the key emphasis was to look at the Lassifrae's eruptive history in the background of societal change. Uh, because huge coincidence that three eruptions are looked at, 1812, 1902, and 1979, happened at uh, three distinct stages of social development. So the 1812 eruption that we're talking about today happened during the slavery era, uh, 1902 happened post emancipation, and then 1979 happened on the eve of the island gaining uh, political independence from uh, Britain. So uh, also talk about how the timing of these volcanic eruptions was key. In fact, they happened at these distinct stages. Um, and this is what makes uh, St. Vincent an ideal case study to investigate how La Sofra exacerbated social, issue, social issues relevant to each period. And uh, also the key to influencing the social, economic and cultural factors of a volcanic island society. Um, and also, uh, this also is, is a personal project because uh, my family um, and ancestors are from St. Vincent and I have uh, gained an understanding of their experiences of La Sofre through storytelling as uh, members of my family uh, have memories of the 1979 and 1902 eruption and they've passed them down to me. So definitely I was uh, in stage where I was like, this is really awesome, I want to learn more. So that's how this project came about, essentially. So a brief history of St. Vincent. Um, as you can see, this is where uh, St. Vincent the Grenadines is. I like to describe it as a tiny island with a big volcano on it. Uh, but interestingly, the first settlement, uh, colonial settlement, was uh, located here at Barrelly. This is a French settlement. And this is actually where my granddad is from. So it was very lovely to go see where my granddad grew up. Uh, but this is uh, the state of La Sofre. Um when I last visited in 2016, this is the crater. So notable here is the post-1979 lava dome slash lava mass. Uh, there's a few more activity, um, localized swimmer activity, small bit of uh, water present, and then uh, evidence of uh, landsliding. <clears throat> So I'll try and keep this as brief as possible. Um, so uh, St. Vincent's uh, archaeological history has shown that it's a migration island from South America. So we have uh, distinct but complex cultural groups um, always migrating from the mainland of South America on and populating the Lesser Antilles Islands. So um, this, uh, from earliest evidence, we have the Saladoid, for example, and then we have uh, the Arawak uh, displaced and absorbed the Salad um, displaced and absorbed cultures. And then from about um, uh, one, uh, 12,000 AD, we have the Kalinigo who uh, came from Venezuela. But then uh, if we zoom in round about here, so in, in, 1620, in 1626, we uh, have a small presence of French, French colonists and slaves. Um, and interestingly, before, before all this, it was discovered by Columbus in, 17, in 1498, but left alone, uh, mainly because, of course, he was seeking riches elsewhere, um, but also because of the strong presence of the Calingo. Uh, but throughout the 1600s, there was a uh, vested interest by the French and British colonial empires, but um, couldn't uh, officially settle on the islands because of strong resistance of uh, the uh, Canlinigo and the Gufana. So um, we have the Gufana uh, appearing, well not appearing, they came to uh, St. Vincent as runaway slaves from Barbados and St. Lucia and the Kalingo took them in. Uh, the British Empire obviously didn't like this and tried to get them back, but there were resistance. Um, we actually have evidence of um, the Kalingo and Gufana fighting French forces on Martinique throughout the 1640s. And then we have uh, the 1718 eruption of La Sofre, 
which uh, we know what happens, but we don't know much exactly what happened during this event. But what was interesting, the year, a year later, in 1719, Barry Lee was established. Uh, in 1748, we have um, uh, the, the island was declared neutral and rightful property of the Kalingo and Gulfana. But uh, the Seven Years' War uh, from 1756 to 1763 resulted in St. Vincent being seceded to Britain following the Treaty of Paris. And a reserve for the Kalingo and Gulfana was established in the north closer to La Safre. And during a period between 1771 to 1808, we had roughly 57,500 African slaves brought to the islands to work on the plantations. Um, and interestingly, we then have uh, British planters attempting to secure land through voluntary sale, military force and encroachment um, in, in this time, but uh, the Gurufana to protect their identity and lands retaliated and this resulted in the first Carib War in 1769 to 1773. Uh, and then in 1779, it was recaptured by the French as part of the American Revolution campaign. Um, and then there was a tropical storm in 1780. And then we had 1783, it was, it was ceded back to Britain following the end of the American Revolution and the Treaty of Versailles. And then we have the Second Carib War that happens in 1795 to 1797, which results in the exile of Gulfana to uh, present day Honduras. And then 1804, we have largest plantations uh, being established closer to Safra and they start production and then 1812, we have the eruption. But in terms of mixed uh, methods approach, I mainly use um, archives to reconstruct what happened, particularly for the 1812 and 1902 eruptions. So this is a form of letters. So here, for example, is a letter from 1812 from an admiral in Barbados who had to, who encountered Asheville as he was uh, going towards St. Vincent on the ship and had to turn back because of the amount of Asheville had diaries, so this is a diary from an, from an American magistrate who happened to be on the island at the time. So he recorded um, information about the eruption. Uh, for 1902, I luckily managed to track down some uh, um, field notebooks from American geologist Edmund Hovey, who was a um, assistant creator at the Natural Museum, the, uh, the, the Museum of Natural History in New York. Um, so his collection uh, was an alternative to the fact that Tempest Anderson's um, notebooks had been lost. So Tempest Anderson was a UK volcanologist who went to investigate 1902. Also historical maps, and these were mainly used to uh, figure out where settlements and plantations were and how the land was divided up. Governmental correspondence, so of course uh, Barbados was the main uh, kind of base of operations for the British Empire in the Lesser Antilles, so uh, lots of correspondence uh, about the eruptions came, um, came via Barbados. Also photographs, so uh, I spoke about Edmund Hovey uh, a moment ago, this is actually a, a photo he took by him. Uh, natural, natural, in Natural History Museum, but interestingly, this is actually in, Ed, in Tempest Anderson's um, collection. So what was interesting is that we have American and British geologists actually um, kind of exchanging notes and um, formulating ideas of what's going on and seeing what's happened. We also have newspaper articles. So this is an article from 1812, um, and this is uh, mainly because uh, British Empire, obviously, British people were obviously interested in what um, um, affairs were going on in the uh, colonial empire. So this is how we managed to get accounts of what was happening. And lastly, for 1979, I managed to do semi-structured interviews as it is still in living memory. <clears throat> so the main thing I did with this, um, all this archival data, it's attorneys into maps to develop an eruption impact maps. So um, how I do it is I'll get a description, locate it on the map, and then just digitize it, essentially. 
and this uh, obviously helped me form a visual representation of what happened in these eruptions and where things were impacted and how they were impacted. And this is mainly because I'm definitely more of a visual learner, so this is definitely more a benefit to me, um, as well as, of course, uh, my research and communicating it. <clears throat> but in terms of partial records and silent voices, uh, observational records are typically incomplete the further you go back in time. Uh, and particularly when it comes to volcanic eruptions, they can miss uh, they can misrecord into discrete activity, contain periods where data was not recorded, or contain random systematic errors. And there's also spatial issues with this as well, um, as the reliability of series goes uh, decreases the further you go back. And archives they do have a culture filter. So this affects the reliability, availability, and completeness, as records have various biases associated with the periods and location in which they were taken. So I tried to address this by employing feminist standpoint theory. So this kind of came about when I was reading these archive accounts and thinking that, oh, these are kind of all just written by the white elite men. Where, what about um, the experiences of women? What about the experiences of slaves? What experiences about um, you know, children, uh, disabled, other marginalized groups. And this is where my third supervisor, Bryony, was like, actually, maybe look to feminist theory to try and help you try and uh, approach this in a way that you can acknowledge, um, you know, the voices are present and just try and uh, turn this into, act, into practical action in terms of your methods. So feminist standpoint theory, this is a theory that uh, says that members of marginalized groups can become subjects and authors of knowledge, speak from a certain location, experience and standpoint. And the voices are differentiated by space, time, relation and place. And the framing of individual or collective identities, subjectivities and positioning are part of the identity work of studying voice. And this is what I believe is quite important for me in terms of trying to decolonize my research and also turn it into something practical. So of this, I couldn't obviously apply it to 1812 and 1902 eruptions because of the way the records were kept, but I could make a conscious decision of being aware of who I was speaking to from my interviews. So I was more conscious and getting more of a diverse range of voices um, in terms of um, collecting their experiences as data. And this essentially helped me to show that actually, even though this volcanic corruption affected the entire island, but it is down to the person, the household, um, in terms of the different experiences that they have, which is related to the mix match effect um, in terms of you can experience the same event differently. So to go to the eighteen twelve eruption proper, this is uh, what was covered. So the eruption occurred for six weeks and it was about a VEI four on the explosivity index. Um, in terms of um, Tefra, uh, it was covered around about the north end of the island. Quite a few lahars occurred. So lahars are volcanic mud flows. We also have pyroclastic density currents. Um, and it actually was a small kind of population. So in terms of how many people were affected, it's actually quite minimal. But the people killed, um, this is all I can uncover from the archives, but it happened to be just slaves. Um, and of course, you have to remember this actually might be a higher uh, number because, of course, slaves were viewed as property, not people. Therefore, um, their deaths may have been accounted for in, um, for example, the damages that occurred on the plantation states. So in terms of these numbers, these are only what I covered from the archives and previous research. There is probably more to this. So this, um, this research I'm presenting is only like probably one story. There's probably other stories to be told about this, but this is all um, that has been uncovered. So uh, I'm just gonna go through the first week as that's where most of the information about this eruption occurs. So activity starts about uh, midday on the 27th of April with ash falling at uh, oh, that's annoying. That's going to get in the way. Hopefully, you can see it. Um, at uh, Wallaboo and Montrond. And then uh, a few days later, on the 30th, we have ash falling um, over Barbados, as well as on uh, Mount Alexander Estate. 
We also have a, a recorded earthquake in the Mont Blanc area. And we also have the first um, evidence of pyroclastic density currents, which for St. Vincent are mainly ash column collapse. So we have evidence of a pyroclastic density current occurring at half one in the afternoon at uh, Rebecca estate and also to Valley's estate. And also we have another recorded uh, pyroclastic density current occurring in the evening um, in the Montmorand area and the Larakai River area. <clears throat> And on the 1st of May, we don't actually have information of what happened on the, on the islands, but we do have the information that ash fell um, on Barbados, Martinique, uh, Dominica, St. Lucia and Grenada. And then on the 2nd of May, we have um, people for the first time managed to get uh, up north to um, fancy in a weir area and showing evidence that the area was buried by ashfall. And then on the 5th of May, uh, between half six in the morning to half 12 in the afternoon, we have ash falling on Barbados, but again, no information on the island itself. And then 7th of May, we have uh, more evidence of pyroclast density currents occurring in the Rabaka rivers, which is roughly about this river here, and the Wallaboo rivers, which is just around here. Uh, and then we also have the first evidence of Laha occurring along Mount Ronde River. But there was actually quite a lot of inf um, hazardous events that occurred in this eruption that did not have dates associated with them. So we have uh, Ashfall uh, causing a manager's house on the Grand Sable estate to collapse, which is down here. Uh, we also have ash falling from Truoma, which is up here, down to Grand Sable. <clears throat> Uh, also an uh, earthquake in the Rebecca River um, Valley area. So for this, I couldn't pinpoint exactly which um, plantation states were impacted. And we also have actually uh, evidence of uh, PD, uh, pyroclastic density currents that blankets, blanketed the flank of the eastern flank and impacted Trumama, Waterloo, uh, Rebecca, Lot number 14, Langley Park, uh, Wallaboo, Montrond, Thomas Fraser Estate, uh, Larakai and Du Valleys. And also we have uh, Vahars recorded in the Rabaki River, Rabaka River and Truma River. Uh, but also uh, to show that this was not over um, um, after the eruption, we also have reported Laha um, uh, occurring from a, uh, a pyroclastic dam being broken and destroying slave huts. Uh, in the Wallaboo area in 1813 or 1814. So this is roughly uh, what's uh, developed in terms of the map in the end. Um, so we actually also have reports of earthquake occurring, uh, being felt in Kingstown as well. But mostly all, most of the impacts were confined to the north and it could be because no one was around in the south to recall these areas or it could be that just there was no actually hazards that impacted this area. So it is, it could be both, it could be either. <clears throat> and this is just to um, zoom in on just the occurrences of the pyroclastic density currents in the Lahars. So uh, here in pink is the ones that um, occurred, um, it didn't have a date associated with them, but these were more uh, blanket uh, PDCs, whereas these ones were more channelized down the river valleys. And interestingly, this one that impacted Wallaboo is actually perhaps associated with a debris avalanche that occurred as 1812 option um, research has shown that a uh, new crater was formed in 1812 eruption and piecing together the archive evidence with this research that actually uh, Duvalis was probably impacted by a debris avalanche and not, uh, not just a power class of density current. So Duvalis estate was a bit unlucky. So bring the map up. So here now we have all estate plantation estates that are in operation. We, uh, from 1801 to 1824, we had 129 estates in operation, but there were some that could not be found in the record. Um, but as you can see, only about nine estates were susceptible to high impacts of lahars and pyroclastic density currents. 
so I bring up this table here. So these are estimated lo um, losses in pounds and shillings by state owners. And I try to see whether these actually correspond to, to the hazard map. And some of these do, some of these did get my head scratching for a bit until I tried to find out what happened. So about 16th of no 6th of November, um, the, govern the governor, uh, Sir Charles Brisbane, to the admin of the Windward Islands based in Barbados, said that um, the eruption has overwhelmed and nearly utterly destroyed several plantations and done injury to others. The contents of the volcano covered the earth for a considerable depth and entirely stopped or absorbed the springs of the two of the largest rivers in the colony from which the mills were supplied with water. And these two rivers were the Rabaka Dry River and the Wallabu River. <clears throat> but um, I'm just going to draw your attention to some um, estates here and the numbers. So one here is Grand Sable Estates. So obviously there was evidence of a manager's house um, roof, roof collapse, but still I thought, <clears throat> excuse me. Still I thought compared to other estates, um, the estimate losses were still quite high. So interestingly, what I found was a letter um, that the colonial government um, wanted to buy land um, from um, co um, Colonel Thomas Brown um, to house um, displaced uh, slaves and turn some of that land into a township. But uh, Thomas Brown in his colorful racist language refused and in the end, um, the military was brought in to persuade him to give up the land. And so essentially some of this money could actually just be sort of money to persuade him to give up that land. And interesting here, so Korea. So interestingly for Korea, there was no, no, no reports of damage in the archives, but it was abandoned in 1812. Um, but then I realized that um, Mackenzie not only owned Korea, but also Truruma, which of course was impacted quite a lot. So it could be the case that um, he sold Korea to fund the repairs for Truruma. And in fact, I didn't put it in here, but also you can see that most of the, the numbers of slaves um, between the two states actually correspond quite nicely. So most of the slaves that were at Korea um, bolstered the number of slaves at Truma. So it looks like not only did he sell the estate, but also moved slaves to um, his slaves to Truma. <clears throat> and then uh, Thomas Fraser estate. So Thomas Fraser um, was a smaller, uh, had small acreage, um, but it was confirmed destroyed and abandoned in 1812. But interestingly, um, Thomas Fraser and Duvalis estates, they were both abandoned, but by 1902, they were estates again. So in 1902, Duvalis was Windsor Forest and uh, uh, Thomas Fraser estate became Fraser's village, which were again, both destroyed in 1902 and now are permanently abandoned to this day. So it could be the case that they abandoned these estates, but because of the valuable land and the fertile soil um, around these areas, um they essentially kind of it was kind of like the cost benefit kind of weighing or risk so they thought that actually because of the profit we get from states we're willing to take that risk or they just didn't learn from their mistakes <clears throat> and here i apologize that might not be that visible but uh this is just to show the production of sugar in pounds from 1801 to 1812. And just to zoom in 1812, there was a reduction in uh, sugar as well as rum and molasses. Um, but by 1813 to 1814, they do increase or go to, um, to towards 1811 values. So despite the fact that production was impacted, um, not just in terms of production, but also transport and also um, selling as well um, and trading. But within a few years, they were back on their feet again. And this one here, the orange one is Waterloo. So uh, it's extensional uh, growth that occurred um, in uh, 1815. <clears throat> so in terms of um, societal kind of behaviors resulting from this eruption, um, 
so this map here on the right is just me putting together all of the PDCs and LAHAs that occurred for 1812, 1902, 1979, but also the location of settlements. So uh, 1812, these are circles. So these are most of the settlements or plantations. Uh, 1902, we have a few more settlements. And then by 1979, we have quite a few more settlements. And it's just um, showing that these areas, despite um, the risk associated with them, are still development occurring. So um, of course, it's not research done by me exactly. That was not the focus, but a research by the Shriva team, for example, um, they have they've associated um, risk and development um, in these areas. In fact, that development is kind of uh, taking precedence over risk, um, mainly because development in the north has been neglected. So in the north, this is more seen as the rural area, whereas in the south, it's more seen as the urban area. But interestingly, in terms of evacuation behaviors, for 1812, um, the Momrond the um, village, which was actually a Kalinigo village, uh, they were the first to evacuate, first to Chateau Belair, uh, which is down here, and then to Kingstown, which is actually similar to what occurred in 1902 as well. They um, evacuated days before first Ashcon collapse. And this might indicate that there was more in-depth knowledge of their environment and the volcano. But of course, because their voices are not entirely present in the um, in the archives, it's hard for me to deduce this. But it may be because they felt earthquakes in the area, then they knew that something was coming, so then they moved out the way. But um, um, by 1902, they were permanently relocated um, to a place down here called Rosebank. Um, so now, of course, the, the kind of knowledge of their environment is probably different. <clears throat> In terms of resettlement, um, this actually happens uh, quite a lot during these eruptions I looked at, but for 1812, some Catalingo families were permanently relocated to uh, Tobago Island, which at the time was, in, was, not, habit, was not inhabited, so um, these Catalingo families were probably the first to inhabit Tobago Island. Um, so this was um, kind of arranged between the admin of the Windward Islands and the governor, um, the, the St. Vincent governor, and also corresponding with the, governance, uh, the governor of Trinidad, um, says something along the lines of, this unfortunate event has struck them with such terror that they cannot be persuaded to settle again in the islands, and there is no other crown lands near the sea fit for inhabitation. They are therefore anxious to leave for the island of Trinidad. Interestingly, with Tobago, um, the governor granted, it, granted them the islands, but they said that they have to fend themselves from French forces, which I found quite funny. Um, in terms of livelihoods, it's very hard to distinguish um, what, uh, in terms of livelihoods, it was impacted because obviously the slaves were obviously essentially for, were forced to work and have a livelihood on these plantations. So um, their experiences are not recorded, but of course, we can obviously say that this eruption did disrupt all aspects of the agricultural industry, including crop and byproduct production, storage, transportation, and trading. So the eruption did temporarily reduce cultivatable land by about 6,080 acres that limited production. And it was uh, about returning to the status quo as soon as possible, then adapting and diversifying, which we would uh, want to see um, um, for people to be more resilient and be more prepared for the next event. Um, but this was obviously not the case. And so in terms of relation with the British West Indies, so um, in 1812, it was more of a geopolitical connection with other British West, West Indy islands. Um, but this transformed more into more of a kingship um, in the 1902 and 1909 eruptions. So uh, I say this is a kingship, it's not by blood relations, but this is more about sharing a common bond and understanding um, by the fact that they, are, they were part of the British Empire and they were descended from slaves. So they had like sort of that common bond. Um, this is something that we see today, and particularly in my culture as I am West Indian, we still see that common bond um, between us, even though we're not from the same island, even though we're not from the same family, we still have that connection. 
But um, this connection does explain the prompt response of disaster assistance following disaster, regardless of volcanic eruption or not. Um, in my thesis, I use the example of Hurricane Irma in terms of how the Caribbean came together to uh, assist one another as, as soon as possible, particularly in assisting uh, Puerto Rico. Um, particularly for St. Vincent, I used the example of Hurricane Thomas that happened in 2010, um, mainly because I remember um, we had a and St. Vincent community, Vincentian communities in High Wycombe and Luton, like held like a, like a carnival and events to help raise money and then send it to St. Vincent. But there's, a, there's also a connectivity before European contact, um, as the Caribbean Sea was uh, used as an aquatic motorway, um, actually, which contradicts the notion of insularity and the flame framing of iron vulnerability which in itself reinforces colonial preconceptions of the Caribbean's um, indigenous past. Um, in terms of aid for this eruption in particular, most aid came from Britain and Barbados, but for 1902, there was considerable more, a lot more of the British West Indies islands helped out. So like Jamaica, um, St. Lucia and um, or not, but also lots of more foreign aid outside of the colonies. So actually we have uh, Belgium, France, um, USA all coming together to help. Of course, this in 1902 is interesting well because obviously it coincided roughly in the same few days as the eruption of Martinique as well. So that was definitely a unique um, thing to investigate. <clears throat> so just to summarize, investigating the eruptive history in the background, social change helps to examine how each eruption's impacts can differ. A uh, mixed methods approach in social volcanology requires multiple data sets to be integrated to capture the complexity of living with volcanic eruptions. However, partial records and silent voices mean that the full picture of impact is never truly complete. Las Ofreas 1902 eruption occurred during the slavery era after a period of conflict between colonial powers and two cultural groups. So it, was, uh, it occurred for six weeks and impacted not only islands but also neighboring islands. Estimated damages by state owners um, sometimes hit stories of additional financial gain. Sugarcane production decreased but recovered relatively quickly. And Calamingo migrated to Tobago and some slaves were rehoused at Grand Supple. And that is the end. All right. Thank you very much, Jasmine. Um, yeah, so uh, what we'll do now is uh, we'll start a QA. Uh, we have plenty of time for that. So the way this will work as last time will be if you want to ask your question, just drop like like with your own words.